Welcome back, everybody, to a special episode of the Dead Film Critic Society podcast. Um, as always, I'm Daniel, your host. Um, again, Aiden is still a little bit busy with uh, schoolwork, so I brought in an, another guest, uh, Steve Norton. He is a editor of Screenfish. Uh, I don't think I've announced it too much on this channel, but I've been it had the chance to be a little bit of a writer for him and his site. And he's been so gracious as to send me some screeners and allow me to come or some of the most interesting films that have come out this year that I've been able to see both through the screeners he sent me and then like Tiff light bell light box. That's usually that's had the Netflix stuff open early. Um, but yeah, I figured I'd bring him on here to kind of, I think I'm going to try to do this with, Aiden as well, but to kind of have a almost end of the year discussion. Um, and particularly, I wanted some of his thoughts about the Oscars and um, what he thinks about those and what he thinks about what might be in contention this year, because there are a lot of interesting films that may win Oscars and, you know, award season is starting to happen. Golden Globe nominations happen. Critics' Choice nominations happen. Those are usually the least relevant of the major awards, but regardless, they, you know, they get people thinking, they get opinions changing. So I figured I'd let him in on some of that stuff. But uh, yeah, thanks for so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I really do appreciate that, Daniel. And I will say that I am not busy with school right now. Um, that's, you know, 20 years ago, maybe. But <laughs> no, I, yeah. I appreciate it. And I love having you on the team. It's Greenfish. And I'm, I'm glad. Let's let's talk some some best films. For sure. Uh, I was going to hop into a couple of quick news bits and see if you have anything to say about those. So I don't know if you saw Minari back in last year in 2021, but Lee Isaac Chung, the director of that, is currently in talks to direct a Twister sequel for Universal. He's currently apparently the number one choice for that. Um, his experience being in the Midwest and I think dealing with like Storms himself and like growing up on a farm has apparently appealed to the producers because I think Steven Spielberg is among them. Um, I don't know if you've seen Twister. I have not. Uh, or if you have any thoughts about that. Well, there, there, therein lies the age gap, my friend. Yeah. I saw it in theaters uh, multiple okay. times. Um, that's an interesting choice. I mean, I, I guess being growing up in the Midwest, you've got some experience. And I mean, I, I don't know what, what take he's done before that, but Twister and Minari could not be di more different. Um, but I mean, it, I mean that film, if I'm, if I'm correct, I think that film was shot by Jan de Bont. I think it was after speed. I think he did that one. Yes. He was, yeah. he was a cinematographer for, for Spielberg on so many projects. Um, and that was, it was a huge hit at the time, you know, a visual spectacle for 1995. Now you'd think it looked ridiculous. Um, but at the time it was like, it was just, it was a fun ride with a bit of story thrown in and a bit of some characters, the lovable misfits chasing down, uh, Carrie Elways is the villain. I'm like, this is a film about storm chasing. You don't really need a villain, but they had one, um, and uh, Bill Paxton, Helen Hunt, Bill Paxton. Oh man, he passed away, of course, a few years ago. Yeah. But uh, it, the films, the films, a hoot. Um, and yes, I did say hoot. But uh, yeah, Lee Isaac Chung is an interesting choice. I'll be interested to see what he has to say. Certainly, understanding life as a storm chaser. See, that would be interesting too, because nowadays the type of silliness we got from that sort of blockbuster of the day. <clears throat> I feel like they're going to move away from that because you don't see a lot of films that goofy uh, at that scale. Nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. At that scale. So I, I, it will be interesting to see if that maybe they're going to take it a little more seriously with his experience. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It like personally, like I would want to see him maybe like, I really love Minari. That was probably definitely top yeah. three movie of 2021 for me. Um, I really loved it. And yeah, I don't know, to see like an Asian American, like almost like, you know, a small indie director, like it's cool for him. Like, you know, Daniel Destin Crane kind of did the same thing, hopping to Shang-Chi universe. This does feel like a little even more like 
out of the box in some ways than like even the stuff that I know like Chloe Zhao did Eternals but then she was also attached to do this like a uh, vampire sci-fi western or something uh for Universal so it's I don't know this is also Universal I don't know these are very interesting projects you know seem very unconventional considering what is you know especially you know, I don't know if Universal's really trying to stand out compared you know they don't really have a you know at least so they own they own harry potter but that franchise is also starting to die down so i don't know if they're really trying to revitalize another one considering you know obviously they have constant competition from disney's giant ips and everything but <clears throat> i don't know it'll be interesting don't to they see have, what comes uh, of that. sorry I, I apologize didn't interrupt i didn't mean yeah. to do that no that's fine um uh, but don't they also have top gun was that them or is that paramount that's paramount paramount has top gun yeah um yeah i i thought minari is brilliant it's an incredible film um it's interesting you talk about zhao because i thought like uh you know you look at zhao coming from nomad land i mean now she had it's not like she released one after or she released one after the other she didn't film one after the other in the same time frame because of course but the jump between the two, and you look at the way that uh, Eternals was handled, it's gorgeous. It's more of a, it, it's gorgeous with beautiful cinematography. Um, it's trying to be more of a character film than a lot of other Marvel films, because that's Zhao. So that's why, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what Lee Isaac Chung does for a movie like Twister, mm -hmm. which is a franchise not known for its characters i mean there's uh, there's the lovable misfits but it's it's really all about the the special effects so i i mean i i hope it's good i i do love his work in in minari so we'll see yeah uh next thing i was going to mention is the barbie trailer i'm assuming you've seen it uh there isn't a ton of footage in it very much a teaser trailer but i don't know if you have any thoughts about that project as a whole Greta Gerwig's directing and co-writing with uh, Noah Baumbach. Uh, Which is interesting in and of itself. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I don't, like, honestly, it makes some more sense for Noah, I think, as a co-writer, because he did kind of do the same thing with Wes Anderson with Fantastic Mr. Fox, like, covering a kid's, like, property in some ways, even though, you know, Fantastic Mr. Fox is a very unique film in that way. But I think from what we saw, we can't say that barbie definitely will carry that same uniqueness because i think you'll probably will uh just from looking at it well you know they were uh, if I, I might be wrong on this but i'm pretty sure they were married um no they're they're dating. divorced now no they're they're no dating? I, they so i think the situation is because i thought no. he divorced her to marriage and they, that's where marriage story came out of Marriage Story, I believe, came out of Noah Baumbach's relationship with Jennifer Jason Lee. They Jennifer were actually Jason married Lee. and then divorced. That's just what I believe. And then Greta Gerwig okay. and Noah Baumbach have been dating for a long time. Okay. And I don't know. I feel like both of them are probably afraid of like the official not. At least maybe Noah is considering his experience before. So they've just been dating for the longest time, mm -hmm. is my okay. understanding. Well, I will say I will say this about the Barbie trailer. I can't believe them. These words are coming out of my mouth. It is one of my most anticipated films of 2023. <laughs> that trailer hit every note perfectly. And you have to understand, this is the film that was unfilmable. So I have a lot of faith in Gerwig uh, as a director and as a writer. This was, uh, and originally this film was supposed to be, I believe it was uh, Amy Schumer was attached. Wow. And then, uh, so with her on board, it was sort of like, oh, okay, I, maybe they're going to do something a little different. And then Margot Robbie signed on, and I'm like, okay. Um, but, I mean, that trailer was note perfect in every single way, even though it's just a teaser. And, I mean, it could be, could be awful. I don't know. But, I mean, yeah. I have a great deal of faith in Gerwig and Bombach to create something unique. Um, and maybe even special because this is how do you make a Barbie film in 2022 well 23 yeah um you know which is a, a brand 
which has, you know, shaped young girl's vision of what it means to be a woman for 60 years and not always in the best of ways. Yeah. And and yet this film was satirical from the get go, even down mm-hmm. to the smashing of the of the old dolls. Yeah. Um, the 2001 uh, tra- trailer parody is brilliant. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing, you know, um, Simu and uh, and Ryan Gosling in, in that in this role, because, again, what is the role of Barbie? And yeah. what is the role of, of, of these characters? I, I just, I am, I am awake for it. And I am, I'm like, my eyes are open and I'm like, I'm ready for this one. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought I'd say that about a Barbie movie. But the Lego movie ha- had much less at stake in terms mm-hmm. of like gender politics. But the Lego movie managed to take a brand, sell you the brand while completely undercutting their own brand. Yeah. And it, it it did so well. So I mean maybe you know, I'm yeah. I'm I'm paying attention. Yeah. I mean obviously I think Greta with her success with Lady Bird and Little Women kind of I like it felt like I don't know, I feel like a lot of like this is another film from like a series of like directors who've had like a few successful films in the past few years, especially like I don't know, I feel like a lot of directors from especially well just 2019 alone you had like thinking well bound back like even like the first look at bong joon ho's mickey 17 looks like he's definitely you know taking the success of parasite and doing something wild with it bomb back had a white noise this year which is definitely a wild take and then now greta gerwig after little women success taking barbie in a whole new direction it seems and yeah i mean i was excited for this like again i've never had any interest in barbie ever like you know but once I knew Gerwig was attached to this, I was like, okay, this is interesting. Cause I really love Lady Bird. I love Little Women a lot. You know, she's done very well so far as director. So I was obviously on board. And then, you know, the cast, yeah, Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, Simu Lu. I was like, okay, there's no way I'm not showing up to watch this movie. And the tra- and obviously the teaser trailer just like sealed it, definitely didn't dismay me at all. I was like, okay, she's doing something with this for sure. And it'll be interesting to see what comes of it. Yeah, I agree with you 100% because I think uh, there's a lot at stake with this film, surprisingly so. Like I, and I don't just mean the Barbie name, and I feel like the Barbie name would would have have this film by the throat because it's such a multinational conglomerate. You know, like you know, they would they would be very careful with it. But they also, given what we where the conversation has gone uh, in the last five years on a on a greater level, the last thing you want to do is reinforce any sort of uh, toxic gender perspectives. Yeah. So I'm I'm so intrigued. I'm so intrigued by this. Yeah. And like, I think I definitely have faith. I think most people have faith that Greta Gerwig will handle this subject matter well, if anyone has, you know, an eye for it, I think it's definitely her. So I'm um, not too worried in that regard but yeah it'll be interesting to see what comes of it because i yeah i am expecting more of a lego movie satirical take overall that will like maybe almost like kind of put a layer there where it's like even if there is maybe some stuff that people have problems with it's like they should maybe understand that there's like a satire level between that but then again who knows it might some people ignore that stuff anyway so who knows um Next thing I wanted to mention was there's been a lot of discourse with the release of Avatar. Uh, you know, James Cameron's been constantly popping up in the headlines with a lot of his takes and comments about the film. The film's obviously a lot being discussed a lot for, you know, just its visuals. Also, like, I think it's most interesting as a box office film, considering, um, you know, a lot of speculation about what its budget was how much James Cameron said this film needs to make as well as what he said about the third film. I'll just read this headline. Um, It's a rumor. I won't say this is real, but confirmed hundred percent, but James Cameron apparently is rumored to have handed in a nine hour cut of avatar three to the studio. (laughs) And then he apparently wants to do all the VFX for the nine hours and then cut it down, which 
um just reading that there's no way disney will do that like they've brought him far enough but i don't i can't i don't know it really i don't know how much james cameron can push this is what i'm basically getting out of this i don't know what your thoughts are about that and my thoughts are is that you need to give more credit to james cameron (laughs) i give james cameron a hard time because I don't love his writing in pretty much any of his movies. I haven't seen the Terminators. I'll give him that. I haven't seen those. But I I don't know. I didn't love the first. Like, I, well, I don't know. I think I've seen Avatar twice. I haven't seen the second one yet. So I'll reserve my comments about that because I have none. Um, but based on what I saw... He just the writing of the first one, which I rewatched, like I think during the pandemic, it just did not impress me. And so th- I was never particularly excited for Avatar 2. And I respect James Cameron for wanting to push a lot of, you know, visual effects and all that technology and stuff. But I could argue that if Marvel directors, and I honestly believe this, that if Marvel directors and other directors that work in like giant blockbusters had as much time as him, they could probably come up with something maybe not as like visually like profound, like, you know, as like breathtaking, but I think something near to the quality and honestly probably would be more fun, maybe potentially. I don't know. That's just my thoughts. I, I don't know. I you clearly have some thoughts. I'm gonna let you I, put those listen, out. Uh, I know this happened before we started the conversation, but uh, you spilled the tea this time. Uh, <laughs> here's okay. Here's the truth. Here, not the truth. Here's 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 what I think. I don't always like James Cameron either. I don't. Um, I think that in some ways, his you know. The only thing bigger than his budgets may be his perceptions of himself. Uh, (laughs) I'm judging. I realize I don't mean to judge him. I don't know him. I'm not saying that. Um, But you can't underestimate him. Three times in his career, three times he has made the most expensive film ever made. And three times he has made money on it. It's his track record as someone who understands the cinematic experience is unparalleled um do all of his stories hit and miss i mean or hit no some miss um i was not excited about the second avatar either i saw the first one in theaters i was in see you saw it for the first time on like disney plus probably Um, i'm trying i did you see it in theaters when it came out probably not i i don't i think i saw one other time though i don't know remember that might like i th- it could have been something like a church event where it was on like a projector screen but again that's not the theater but not the same no it's not the same the reality is when avatar came out it was groundbreaking it didn't make money because it was brilliant it made money because it was beautiful yeah and and the second avatar i mean not to get into story or anything, but I'm because I'm not going to. Um, when it when I saw when I you know I've seen it and the, the first part was like wow this is impressive. When they hit the water, when they hit the water, it may be the best visual effects I've seen since Jurassic Park. And and I say that because Jurassic Park was its own thing at the time. It was unbelievable. It was it was an experience that we've never had um in terms of visual effects when he made titanic like you talk about if if marvel directors had more time the the guy understands cinema at a level that that a lot of other directors simply don't and i that's not a shot at any marvel films or anything but i'm just saying james cameron understands and is so nuts I think I described him recent. I described him recently as he's piece that he seems like the type of guy that if you went out to if you went out to dinner with him, he would order for you and then tell you how to eat it. And afterwards, you'd go, "Man, I don't like that he did that, but he was right." 
And he, like, it is unreal what he can do on a big screen. In terms of story, sure, hit and miss. Titanic is one of the most iconic love stories of all time. Uh, people talk about the love story. No one really talks about the story of Avatar. They talk about the visuals. Um, and they, that'll be the same with the sequel. But, you know, the, you telling me, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but you telling me he has a nine hour cut and he wants the visuals before he does it. I don't know if it's true, but it's so in line with what I've seen from James Cameron over the last 30 years that I, yeah. but, but <clears throat> I remember like with, with every, when Avatar 2 was coming up, it again, for a movie that is the sequel to the biggest box office hit of all time, there's surprisingly little fanfare for it in the month leading up to it. Um, but once you see it, you know why, you know why it's there, you know why that people are giving him hundreds of millions of dollars for budgets because he does amazing things. He, he really does. And listen, his Spielberg, Spielberg changes hearts with his films. Cameron, Cameron blows minds and, uh, and he makes money because of it. But his films don't always translate well on TV because of that. Right. Um, but Terminator 2, Titanic and Avatar all had the, great, the highest budgets for their era ever. And they all made money. Um, Titanic was number one in the theater for, I think, 16 weeks. Yeah, something ridiculous um, like that. You know, it was it was crazy. It was crazy. But it just kept people. were pe Now we put such an emphasis on front loaded box office. Titanic made 29 million in its opening weekend, if I remember correctly. Right. And then it just kept doing 20, 20, 20, 25, 20, like just over and over and over again because of the visuals. It's because the visuals so so you cannot count him out man you cannot even if you don't like his stuff he knows what you want to see in a theater i don't know if he knows what i want to see in a okay. theater but he knows, he knows what the general he knows what the world wants to see in a theater i'll give him Fair that. Enough. that's the other thing is that one of the things he's still been able to do is that his films are brought like and i guess the story is part of it and maybe why i don't find his stories as challenging is that he's managed with avatar especially and probably Titanic to reach a, gl a truly global audience. Cause like, if you look at the box office intake from the past weekend, more like more than double of it was internationally. I think it was around 350 yeah. million ish while it only brought in around 130 ish million domestically. Give it time. Um, yeah, for sure. I it mean, I'm, I'm not calling it yet. Way. I'm not calling it yet. For sure. I'm not going to try to say like it's, you know, but also like the budget, like James Cameron himself said it would have to be, I think, what, third or fourth most highest grossing film ever to make money. And the budget still and I don't think there's ever been there hasn't been an official statement because they I think they want to give it a few more weeks, but it's been reported to be around four hundred and sixty million dollars. Which of course is just absurd in of self to make a movie for that much money. It just seems insane, but um He's got the street cred though. This yeah. is the thing. He's got the street cred. Like this is not a guy who, you know, made a couple of indie films. Oh, for sure. And and then said, you know what would be great? I really want to make this film about giant blue people afar and on a far off earth. And yeah. you can have all our money. Like nobody else is pulling this off. Um, no. And again, it's because the visuals. It's it's because the visuals. That's what it, he he invents his own tech. Yeah. Um, the the documentary he did on Titanic, he created the lens, or he his team invented the lens, um, that that would allow for deep sea cinematic experience in terms of deep sea um, cinematic recording. For, for that level of depth at the time, he's like, yeah, I want to do that, but I have to do it this way. Um, now, do I think he's probably a madman? Maybe. Uh, maybe he's mellowed a little bit in his old age. I don't know. But you can't, you can't bet against him. You can't do it. I'm still going to do it, and I'm wrong. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Fair. But here's the other thing to remember. I'm willing to bet that the third movie is a heck of a lot cheaper. Because first of all, it's already shot. Second yeah. of all, 
they're using the same landscapes. And that was the, that was the deal he struck with the first Avatar. Probably, yeah. He said, look, if you let me do this and it doesn't make money, I can do sequels and we'll make our money back. And they said, okay. So the third movie is going to be a heck of a lot cheaper because they have all the landscapes and, and VS, VFX stuff on his hard drive. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes that makes sense. I didn't honestly think of that. But yeah, especially like, if he's like good enough to kind of keep this as whatever he's expanded with between these two films is like Pandora for the most part, at least then yeah, I guess they can reuse a lot of the yeah, like you said, the worlds and landscapes and designs they have for these characters don't have to hire new artists to make them. Well, now I was gonna get into a little bit of Oscars talk. I know you've seen some, you know, I've that's a big way I've gone into movies was first during the pandemic, uh, you know, when I was looking on movies to watch, I started getting looking at like some of the movies that were not made for Oscars. And so I was like, OK, sure, let me watch some of these. And they like very much expanded my world when it came to movies. Um, So I've always kind of loved them for that, even though, you know, no one's ever going to agree with everything they pick, least of all me. Um, But yeah, they're. A big and so I've always kind of been interested in the Oscars. A lot of the people I ended up watching on YouTube is like part of my investment movies, like often dealt with the Oscars. Some literally just calling like literally only doing like Oscar prediction, most the majority of their content being about Oscar predictions and such. And I've somewhat followed that trend. I've made a decent amount of videos about Oscar predictions, and those were usually my most successful. So I kept doing those, and I usually like. You know, I liked the, for me as a more binary thinking person, like, you know, I was telling my family this yesterday, but if you remember the Fablemans between Mitzi and Bert, I'd probably be Bert explaining how a movie works by saying, you know, to a child, if I had a kid that is, you know, moves at 24 frames per second, I'd be talking like that. So the Oscars for me are very, you know, even though obviously they, you know, art can't be objective like that, it's a nice way for me to kind of add some numbers and like, you know, throw a little bit of my analytical brain into, you know, uh, art for my love and, you know, try to figure out what's happening in these Academy voters heads. Um, because, you know, sometimes like I've been fairly successful. Uh, sometimes I like the main thing, like there's this thing called gold derby, which is where a lot of people who predict Oscars try to like, you know, it's almost it's, it's not betting, but like they have like things you can fill out predicting what you think will be nominated in each category and then they like based on how many you get correct they like kind of rank you and they also use odds as like a tiebreaker so if it's like a lot of people are picking this well then obviously it's not going to be worth very many points um but then ones that not as many people are picking then you can pick and they'll get you more points for that but um i was able to come top 24 once for nominations which was nice um i have not repeated that success but felt good when it happens um but anyways uh yeah i don't know i was just wondering what some of your takes are on the oscars how you got into them and what you kind of think of them now well i got into the awards um i got into the oscars probably i was younger than you um you know they were just on tv so i mean this is again, this is the nineties, I admit it. So it's sort of like, okay, well, we didn't have the internet and it was just sort of like the big thing on TV. And uh, my mother and I would watch together, it became a thing that we would do. Um, I fell in love with the pageantry of it. The idea of predicting is, is always sort of fun. And, and, you know, um, you know, it, the, the Oscars are a funny thing and that everybody watches it and then everybody complains about it the next morning is, yep. is, is almost hilarious. Um, and I think at the time I put a lot more stock into the idea of best picture. Mm -hmm. um, see, you're, you may be, uh, I'm more Mitzi. You may be the dad, but I'm more Mitzi. Um, hold on a second here. I'm sorry. That's I know, okay. I know, this, I know what's happening here. Come um, here we go. Yeah, I'm more, I'm more Mitzi. So for me, the the films it's the meaning of the films that matter far more than the technical technical side of it i mean technical stuff is wizardry is incredible don't get me wrong but uh and you know screenfish comes out of that let's be serious 
But I, it's funny now because now with the awards, I almost enjoy them more because I take them far less seriously. Um, I'm talking to, right. a, you know, I'm talking to a friend of mine now. Uh, actually, this was for our Avatar podcast, and they said the nomination is the award, and I think that's absolutely accurate. You know, I remember the year that uh, King's Speech took Best Picture. Yeah. And it was one of the more fascinating moments in Oscar voting history because it was so split down the middle between that and the social network. And it seemed like if you were under the age of 40, you were it's social network all the way. If you were over the age of 40, it was King's Speech. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was, there was, and they were even splitting the awards, the SAGs, the DGAs, like they were all getting split. That mm -hmm. doesn't happen very often. No. Um, so it, nobody knew what was going to happen. Like this was a big, big deal. And, uh, and I remember Spielberg came out and handed out the best picture award. And his comment was, uh, the winner I will announce will, will be one of these films. And he lists all these best picture nominees. And he says, and if the ones that don't will be these films. And he lists all the great films like Pulp Fiction, Raging Bull, like all these films that are like didn't win Best Picture. Yeah. And and it was kind of funny. In that one moment, the air got let out of the balloon and people went, Oh. Well, yeah, okay. So when King's Speech won, the fervor wasn't where it because it was, I mean, it, at that point online, the the it was like fever pitch. Like everybody was like, you know, it's this or it's this. And uh, so the idea of the nomination being the award, I think is great. There's, there's lots of great films that don't get nominated. Yeah. The idea of what is best in film is entirely decided by politics and entirely decided by, and entirely decided by, you know, uh, campaigning. And, hold on one second again. She's, she's old. Come here, girl. Are you gonna sit with me then? I try, I, I do it again. Uh, the entire, uh, uh, the winner is decided by politics. The winner is decided by, by campaigning. Um, and, and there's so many other factors. And what decides, how do you decide what a best film is? A film is not a math problem. Yeah. You know, like, for sure. there are some people who will feel that, that Avatar is the best film of 2022. I think they'd be wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's because it speaks to them in some way, or there's something about it that they say, this is, this is what film means to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't put the same level of value on the winner. Like I used to, uh, I, I have a blast. I watch the Oscar Oscars every year. We have Oscar parties. We do Oscar pool. We have, it's, it's just so much fun. Mm -hmm. Um, I have yet to ever manage to watch all nominees for best picture before the award is handed out. So I can't say that I've, I, every year I managed to do it for some reason, at least one squeaks through or something yeah. like that. And I missed it or time, but I love the Oscars. I love it. I love the pageantry. I love the ridiculousness of it. Um, the, the moment where La La Land accidentally beat out Moonlight is yeah. a great moment, not because La La Land is great, but because of the insanity of the moment. I'm like, this is just, this is just, this is great TV. Yeah. Um, and Moonlight was the correct winner in my mind. That was one year they got it right. Mm. But man, like, I, I, so yes, I have an absolute love for the Oscars. I love the award season. I love tracking them. Um, but I don't do so with the same level of necessity. Not necessity, that's not the right word. Um, I just don't put so much stock in what the best picture winner is. Like if, if everything everywhere doesn't win best picture, you know, okay. Um, they'd be wrong, but, <laughs> but again, I say that from my perspective. Yeah. Uh, but I, so I, it's, I have such a strange relationship with them and that I absolutely adore them, but I know they're never accurate or at least they're never accurate to me. Yeah. Like, I, I still think that Get Out not only should have won Best Picture of that year, it's one of, I think Shape of Water won that year. Yeah. And that's the film that people are talking about still. No one talks about Shape of Water. That's the one that left the bigger cultural imprint. Fair enough. I won't argue with that. I like Shape of Water better, but. Well, I think. I, I, won't, I, think I won't lie. Shape yeah, I won't argue with. Film. 
get outs impact i think they're both good for sure yeah but see that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying they're both nominated for best picture i'm not saying shape of water is a bad movie yeah and i no. think we take that as, like i'm not saying it at all i'm just saying for me i think in that year <clears throat> get out should have taken it because it meant more on a grander scale now it meant more to guillermo uh, del toro for sure for shape of water but I think that of of that year, that's the film we're still talking about, and and we'll probably be talking about for the next five to ten years. Yeah, I mean, it made the so, BFI no. top one hundred, so it's clearly it's a great film. Yeah, it's good. You know, it's sorry there for I a reason. To go on for that's okay. Absolutely. <clears throat> um. Yeah, I mean. I I was just personally looking at if I had watched. I think I managed to watch all of the best picture nominees from 2020 actually, because I had literally nothing else to do. I think I wait. Did I actually maybe I didn't watch The Father before the award ceremony? That might have been the only one. Actually, no. It was because it was in April. Never mind. I did. Because it was in April. Yeah. Because it was in it was in April that year. So I did manage to see them all that year. Oh, well, uh, the awards were yeah they were that was. Yeah. Just- it was late. Yeah, it was when it was in April. Yeah, cause, yeah. Um, that's the only year I managed to do it, and I didn't last year. I probably, I think. It, well, actually, I, I, sh- I shouldn't say that. I still haven't seen Drive My Car, which I think is the only one I didn't see from last year. But, um, regardless, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I have always, yeah. I like. I pretty much agree with most of the things you say. I like looking at it analytically i don't like care too much if i get them right or if what i want to win wins in the end like this year i really do think everything every well at once should win i will definitely not be heartbroken if it goes to like a fableman's or a even banshees and top gun are rising up in the ranks right now i will not be mad mm-hmm. if any of those win even top gun which i would prefer it not to i think you know it's gotten enough recognition and love from the box office and just audiences in general it doesn't need the more prestigious award necessarily but if it happens it happens um definitely not gonna fight anyone over it um yeah like i think i don't know i feel like the only year i really cared what i was trying to do and hoping is that i'd see uh the best picture winner at tiff early because the one movie i saw at tiff 2020 online was nomadland and so i was like okay one year streak right and then i thought it was going to be power of the dog last year and i was like okay i'm going to go two for two and then coda won and i was like well it's not going to happen this year so i would be caring about the fablemans winning and maybe if power of the dog won last year just so i could have that streak but it's not meant to be so we'll see i could go for two for three without wanting to necessarily but We'll see you already got a better record than me until until nomadland i had never seen the best picture winner at tiff oh. um and it, it i always missed it even if it was like the winner of like the the uh people's choice um i i it was it, if it was if i saw the people's choice winner then it would be like the artist <laughs> that won or something i'd be like oh I, yeah that was there oh it was oh, okay um, but I think I, I, I did see Coda uh, beforehand and I did see I did see um, Nomadland. But I mean, it's that's what I mean. It's impossible to predict. And yeah, and Tiff often has the uh, often has the winner and definitely has nominees. Definitely um, has nominees. Yeah, like I think um, pretty much over the past decade. Or like even like twelve years or so, the best the People's Choice winner has only not been nominated once, I believe. Yes, uh, oh, I can picture it, but I can't remember its name. Um, but yes, you're right. I mean, it's it's, and actually, the year that Argo won, I remember reading an article by uh, uh, Roger Ebert. And I forget what film they are. Everybody was saying it's going to be this, it's going to be this, it's going to be this. And Roger Ebert was the one that said, uh, it's going to be Argo. People said, no, 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 it's not Argo. It's going to be, he said, no, no, you wait, Argo, you got, you're, you're, you're neglecting the, the power of TIFF. And I'll never forget that. He's like, there, you know, you cannot, you cannot discount um, TIFF's ability to, to do that. And then Argo won. 
And everyone was like, what? Ebert just, he was like, yeah, I, I told you. <laughs> um, yeah. But now I, I think it's far less, like awards go all year. Like, I mean, the, like the, it used to be anything, like you were out if you were released after mid-September uh, or before mid-September. But now, I mean, Coda won at Sundance and it like, yeah. and came out in Sundance. And she, it came, also came out at on Apple in August, which is why no one was predicting it until like it started getting nominated at these awards groups in December for like yeah. November, October, like, you know, during fall festival season, everyone was like, oh, these are the film, you know, the fall festival things. Probably one of these is going to will and win and Power of the Dog emerged as kind of like the front runner having, you know, done decent at TIFF, having very high critic scores you know enough people seemed to like it and then it started like obviously critics groups loved it they adored it it was like winning so many places cody smith mcphee was even winning like a lot of critics groups for supporting actor um he even won the golden globe in the end but troy kotzer won the rest of them and won the oscars so and along with coda winning best picture so yeah i don't know yeah like that's something interesting to me is that like you never know one of these films that like releases before is gonna like clearly be an awards contender. I mean, everything ever well wear all at once, I think is one of the clearer ones that is like everyone. Some people had been like, like even the people who really love the movie, I know had to like sort of been doubting maybe if it will definitely be an awards contender, but it's definitely emerged as one like, cause people just like love that movie. Um, and yeah, kind of why I have it as the front runner right now. Cool sorry um yeah it, it is i don't know if it's the front runner because i'm still not sure about it being a genre film but i mean shape of water was a genre film parasite in some ways is a genre film um but this is such a highly genre film that you just now i just never know like is it going to fall away of district nine which is a fantastic film and just a wonderful nominee for for that year i was quite proud of them for nominating district nine but but it's but the thing that it's got going for it is michelle yo and michelle yo is maintaining in every conversation for best actress um so that's that's keeping it near the 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 top i suppose yeah um i also think the daniels are emerging as like director contenders even though like Spielberg is a very, very good chance of winning that. But I think the Daniels have started to like show that they will be probably in that category and will be at least competing. The other thing that um everything where all at once will have is Ki Hoi Kwan having a very good chance of winning best supporting actor. He's been the front runner for that in pretty much every group. Um, and it's not too close. Like they're nominating both the guys from Banshees of Brendan Gleason and Barry Keoghan. But no one's really in talks to really compete for the win nearly as much as him. Not even close. So I really think he has a very good chance there. And everything, every role at once has also like been getting over nominated and supporting actress. Like they nominated Jamie Lee Curtis at both the Golden Globes and the Critics' Choice. And I don't think SAG should be far behind. BAFTA might skip on it. But and Stephanie Hisu also got a Critics' Choice nomination. So there's a chance both of them end up getting in at the end of the day. So with that kind of like awards, like support and original screenplay, I think it would probably have to be the front runner at this point. Like Banshees is also very strong in that the Fablemans is still kind of there, but I think people will be more focused on potentially giving it to Spielberg for director that I don't know if they're going to potentially think to give it the original screenplay. So I think it's very strong there. It's in the same way that while like, you know, Get Out, get out one original screenplay being a genre film and like especially in original screenplay yes. they usually are willing to give it to cooler more genre like films like they gave it to eternal sunshine which wasn't even nominated for best picture and even though it's kind of almost like a sci-fi romance like you know existential thing that's you know but it's still pretty accessible and people liked it and still probably the coolest film i think at least personally in my opinion from that year um and so I think it is a very good chance, especially considering original screenplay is probably the most competitive category at this point. Um, like between Banshees and the Fablemans and still have like Tar hanging around there. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I think, I think, well, I mean, the screenplay nom is often used as the, the second, the, the gift to the, for the front runner gift or whatever it is, runner up gift to those that aren't going to win best picture. So that's not always the case. Sometimes it wins both. I think Parasite won both. I could be wrong on that. It won director um, and screenplay. Like most it, best picture winners, I think. Too. Yeah. It won. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It won the screenplay and, but oftentimes what you'll see is they'll, they'll give it to something else because they're not giving it to get best picture. So like if everything, every, if people are like, Hey man, that was, that movie was great, but it's not my best picture of the year, but we'll give it screenplay. And I think that was the case with get out. That was the case um, with get out. And I think, pardon? That was the case with get out, but there has been a little more of a trend to where, cause like parasite, like to win both director and screenplay hasn't been as common in the past mm. decade or so. It's been more like a screenplay winner will also win best picture winner. And that screenplay winner will usually go along with an acting win. Like we saw with Coda won adapted screenplay and best supporting actor. Uh, Nomadland did get that best director picture combo. Um, I'm trying to think. Parasite had both. We go back to 2019, you have uh, Green Book, which got original screenplay, and then Mahershala Ali, supporting actor. Um, 20, 2016, you have Moonlight, Mahershala Ali again, and an adapted screenplay win for Barry Jenkins, and then the movie wins. So it has there has been a little bit of more of a trend to where the screenplay winner, at least, well, the thing about screenplay winners is that there's two categories for them. So, you know, it, depending on which category, like right. you know, your status as a so-called front runner, and depending on what category you're competing in, it can matter a whole lot more. Because I think if everything a rare war all at once starts winning a lot of screenplay awards, I think that shows like a lot of strength for it in picture. Because I I see the very clear combo where it wins screenplay and then Ki Hoi Kwan wins best supporting actor, even if they do end up giving director to Spielberg, which I don't think is even guaranteed at all. I think I think what you do with the Spielberg one, if they give best director to Spielberg, and I'm okay with that. Um, he's already won it twice, but yeah. like it's Fableman Fableman's is a thanks for the memories movie, and that would be a thanks for the memories Oscar. And I mean Spielberg's still continuing to put out grade grade A material at at his age. But let's be serious. The Fablemans was a it was it was a I'm going to tell my story before someone else does movie. Yeah. And uh, which is what made it special. You know, I'd rather have Spielberg tell me that story than, you know. Christopher Nolan, and I'm just picking somebody off the top of my head yeah. or, or somebody, you know, in, in 10 years. say, so, you know who I loved Spielberg? Um, I guess it would probably be J.J. Abrams. <laughs> probably. I loved Spielberg. So so I'm going to tell his story. Like Spielberg, Spielberg did it and he did it beautifully without it being like, look how great I am. And uh, we just potted on that last week. And I thought it was a brilliant movie. Um, so I think if he gets it, it'd be fine, but it would be much more of a thank you, Stephen award. Yeah. Um, I think the Daniels took the most complicated movie in years and made it somewhat, and made it coherent enough to, to function a movie um, that everybody remembers. Yeah. And they would be very, very uh, deserving of the award um, as well. I mean, Matthew McDonough. Um, Martin Matthew McDonough. McDonough? Martin Michael McDonough. McDonough? The, 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 Martin, Martin, Martin McDonough. I knew it was yeah. him. Yeah. Martin yeah. with Banshees. It, it, he does a wonderful job, but it's a simple movie. Yeah. A very simple movie to shoot in a lot of ways. Um, not saying that films are simple, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Comparatively. Comparatively, yeah. So I think, I you know, I, I think we'll, it'll be interesting to see because, it, I mean, a lot will happen. Yeah, to me, it's between Banshees and everything everywhere. And I think once January hits and the SAGs and the DGAs and all those ones start rolling, um, I think that's where you'll get noticed. I put no stock into the Golden Globes at all. I have zero faith in them. Um but I do think that once the other awards like Critics' Choice and that start rolling, then you'll start seeing trends develop. Yeah. Of where the wind is truly blowing. Fair enough. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, Critics' Choice, like, Everything Everywhere All at Once also very much overperformed, at least compared to people's expectations. It had 14 nominations at the Critics' Choice, which is almost kind of absurd. It, like, it had nominations like costume, production design, you know, stuff it's really not expected to get at the Oscars, nor was it even expected to really get for the Critics' Choice. Also, like, makeup and hairstyling, that was something that was kind of being underrated as well visual effects something that it's not definitely not guaranteed considering uh, it depends what the vfx branch goes and you know considering how small that vfx team is it's you know it'll be interesting to see what they think of that but <clears throat> um i mean i might as well I, I i don't know if you've read them i might as well just read down what i have for best picture right now uh so i currently have everything everywhere all at once at first i I do think at the end of the day, it will be the film that people love the most from this year. Uh, I still have The Fablemans in number two. I do think if everything everywhere all at once doesn't win, it'll be because people just love the fate, you know, a class like a more of a classic Oscar type film like The Fableman and Steven Spielberg too much, and that will overpower enough. Uh, number three, I have Banshees only because it is another film that, again, it's not like as genre as everything everywhere all at once but it has like that wide appeal like i pretty pr pretty much everyone who's seen it i think likes it especially like more academy type people overall um they also really like it number four i have top gun maverick like i don't think this will win at the end of the day but it's continued to honestly outpace my expectations for it in the award season it's kind of become a cinematography front runner, which I didn't honestly expect. Um, but it's really up there. Tar is number five. I don't think it will win. I doubt. I like. I very much doubt it. But it seems like a very easy nomination as like kind of the critics' pick overall as like highest on Metacritic score. Number six, I have women talking. Uh, it's underperformed a little bit, unfortunately. Even you know, it had it got placed second at TIFF, which was good. Uh, it's been considered the adapted screenplay winner for a while. I don't think that's ever going to change, and for that reason alone, should probably get in. The performance for best director has been a little inconsistent. Sarah Pauli did get Critics' Choice, but the Critics' Choice gave ten nominations out, which is cool, but it also makes it almost impossible to discriminate who might actually get the oscar nominations and then it also but it has plenty of other categories it also is struggling a little bit in supporting actress because i think a lot of people are trying to decide between claire foy and jesse buckley and no one's really deciding so as a result it seems like they're getting vote split like neither of them got golden globe nominations jesse buckley's got a critics choice nomination but i know it'll be interesting to see what the sags do in that regard uh number seven i have avatar i mean you know we talked about this but i'm not gonna doubt james cameron and director honestly at this point because yeah like just all the you know just the fact that we're talking about him this much like even if i you know don't love him is like very much evidence that i think he and avatar is very good chance to do well at least at war season all along with you know just its performance as a global phenomenon Eight, I have Elvis. I think that is very likely to get in at this point. It's, you know, a movie that is very much performed well over the past, you know, little bit. It's gotten nominations for director at both Golden Globes and Critics' Choice. Uh, and it's kind of a more of a classic Oscar biopic type of movie. It's very much seems like it'll follow kind of in the trend of Bohemian Rhapsody. Austin Butler is great. He's very much a front runner for actor. Babylon number nine. That's also done pretty consistently well. It has mixed reception overall critically, but I think there'll be enough people who love it who kind of put it like number one on their ballots that it will squeak in there, or at least top like top on their ballots, and so it'll get in there. And then right now, my uh, number 10, which is a little bit of a long shot, is RRR. But I think that has the potential to get in because it's done very well at critics groups. It's done well at the critics choice. So I think it might have the chance to get in there. Yeah, I think RRR is going to be one that people go, what? But it's uh, I think it's I think you're right on that one for sure. 
Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good list. Um, I don't have them listed of which ones I think. I would. I agree with you that the top three are Banshees, Fablemans, and uh, Banshees, Fablemans, and uh, and everything everywhere. Uh, I think women, woman, uh, women talking is a lock uh, on a Best Picture nomination. Um, I think that Woman King will surprise with a nomination. Uh, I think Avatar is a lock. Um, I think Avatar 2 will do as well as Avatar 1, which is a you have a scads of nominations and take three. Um, and uh, that'll take that'll really tick off James Cameron. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think uh, I think Glass Onion. Let give Glass Onion a chance if if Daniel Craig sneaks in there. The, the, some of the acting categories, I actually think it's been a really good year of film. Some of the acting categories are just cutthroat this year, and you could see Daniel Craig get nominated. You won't win. Um, and my one of my favorite films of the year won't get nominated for Best Picture, but it is The Whale. As uh, I think it's one, of, it, it won't get nominated for Best Picture. I am still rooting fully. I'm in. I'm on Brendan Fraser's you know bandwagon all the way yeah. because his performance is incredible. Um, but I don't, I, I, I think he'll get nominated. I hope the film does, but I don't think it will. Yeah. Um, as, as well. And I mean, you know, like, I think I, they never go to 10. I think that's hilarious. They have 10 nominations and they stop at nine. So they changed the system it. actually. So they do 10 now. Have they changed the voting? They changed the system. They do 10 now. Cause they had 10 yeah. last year. Um. Yeah. They had ten nominees last year. I thought they only had nine. Yeah. No, they had ten. I'm okay. I'm pretty sure, or maybe that they didn't. I know that you're doing ten this year. I'm. I'm pretty sure that this is the way. I, well, they've always check. been able to do ten. Uh, yeah, but I think they actually did do ten last year, and that's what it's going to be from now on. The way the system works now, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, they did ten. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there will be ten. Um, Glass Onion. As far as like my thoughts about that, I really like it. I think it's a really fun movie. I have it number twelve right now. It's you know it's very close. Sure. I I don't know. Like yeah, I think Best Actor right now is looking like it's it's a very it's honestly a, like besides the top three, which I have is Austin Butler, Colin Farrell, Brendan Fraser. The rest is a little bit mixed. Um, I honestly don't have Daniel Craig in my top 10 right now. I think, I don't know. I think it's just such an, like, it's a really fun performance. Don't get me wrong. I think it's just maybe too fun for the Oscars, especially in like an acting category where they really like their, you know, serious, like, you know, biopic kind of like drama stuff, which is why like Butler, Farrell and Frazier are kind of number one hey, for me. Um, remember Johnny Depp got nominated for playing Jack, Captain Jack Sparrow. But that was also supporting actor. They're usually a little more like, and that's why I have Kihoi Kwan number one. They usually yeah, go with more actor. fun stuff. In, in the, but I thought it was for lead. Was he supporting? I'm pretty sure he was supporting for Pirates of the Caribbean if he got nominated. I'm checking it out. I'm checking it out. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. That was oh yeah, I was wrong. It's best picture. Yeah. No, that's best actor. I was wrong about that. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't underestimate it, but he did get I'm the... I'm not saying he will. I'm just saying yeah. he could sneak in. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that would blow anyone's mind. I think, again, I don't know. I think no one can take that Southern accent seriously, though. But not that he needs to be taken seriously to get an acting nomination, no one... potentially, but... But you're not expected to take him seriously. No one, no one's sitting there saying, "I believe you're Southern." But his performance is so energetic and so wonderful. Like I don't think he'll do it, but if he, it, it wouldn't be a surprise if he did. Yeah, um, I think Austin Butler did an excellent job. He shouldn't win. Um, okay. If he does, then it's entirely because of marketing. To me, I think he's okay. great. Yeah, in the film. Because I currently um, have him number I one. I think over over say uh uh. Colin Farrell. Pardon? 
I currently have Austin Butler. You have him number one. one? I currently have no. I think he'll follow in a Rami Malik sort of Bohemian Rhapsody type of win at this point. And I think he's better than Rami Malik. I think it's a very easy performance to nominate and give the win in the end of the day. Especially if people more like the more acclaimed performances may be Farrell and Frazier among like the more prestigious critics type of stuff. But I think that's honestly a little more split between them. I don't know. And it's if the whale is getting nominated for best picture and I haven't seen Frazier's performance, you've, you know, I've heard lots of good things about it. I'm going to be seeing it tomorrow. Um, I, if the whale is getting nominated for best picture, I would be a lot more likely to think that Brendan Frazier will win. But Elvis is also showing a lot of strength, and Austin Butler has been a big part of that, mm-hmm. and is that kind of. I mean, he gives a very, you know, he kind of disappears. He is Elvis in that movie, um, and he does it for like two and a half hours as well. So, yeah, it's a, it's a fair argument. Oh, yeah. I think he'll get nominated, and I think he should be. Personally, I don't think he should win, and I didn't think, even though Ram- Rami Malek won because of Live Aid. Like he won because of his performance in Live Aid was one is absolutely incredible. The rest of the film was like, oh, uh, <laughs> to me. Right. Um, but I mean, I was, I, it was, I think you're right. I think you make some great points. So it could happen. Um, man, I would be upset if Brandon Frazier didn't get it over, over that, even though I thought you're right. He, he disappeared into Elvis. It also helps that he's, a relative unknown on the on the grand stage on the on the big screen yeah um so it's that i mean he uh, he was doing cw shows i think before that so yeah i mean uh, this is a very unique actor lineup in that way there's not like a ton of star power honestly overall like they aren't names that necessarily them alone you'd go like brendan fraser's obviously you know had a cool comeback this year and it's nice to see that Farrell hasn't released like people aren't going to a movie really like or feral really the like the other person who like the only person i think really like the two people who have that power would be tom cruise and hugh jackman tom cruise of course he's surprisingly in contention um like i think he's good in the movie it doesn't obviously strike i think anyone really is a best actor performance but he's definitely i have a number six right now i think he definitely has the potential uh to get nominated Bill Nighy is number four for me right now. I think he'll probably yes, get in. I haven't seen that film. But it's a very easy, like Sony Pictures Classics is very good at getting like one actor in. And Bill Nighy's done very well with like awards groups overall. So I think he'll probably get in. I have Diego Calva number five. I I like, I haven't seen the performance yet. I really hope this happens probably once I see it. Because I think it's just a lot more fun than like a Tom Cruise or a Hugh Jackman in the sun. Um, but For which film? Babylon. Oh, right. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he did get the Golden Globe Comedy Award, but I don't know. The actor category, I think the actress category is a lot more stacked, honestly, overall. Like with, you know, perform- like if I some of the like especially for like the typical oscar type of performances like these big like dramatic like showy performances they have a lot more of them in best actress overall i think like i said like daniel deadweiler from till had a lot of raves michelle yo michelle williams margot robbie Kate blanchett those are who i have most of my five and that's when you exclude like viola davis and the woman king and olivia coleman and even naomi aki who in i want to dance with somebody which those type of performances usually get nominated. It's from the same writer who did Bohemian Rhapsody and the two popes. Like he is very good at getting actors nominated from, from his movies. So I wouldn't underestimate that either, but it's just a very tough category, honestly. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Is there, is there something that you would like to see nominated that you know, probably won't be? overall yeah any category in any category um i mean i would like like if i was personally i mean if you look at this poster behind me i'm a fan of the movie after yang i would like i would you know if coke donata got a nomination for director i would like that um that's not gonna happen um after (laughs) unfortunately you know 
was you know it did well critically it wasn't beloved beloved especially compared to some other films but that is one i wish had more hype um i think nope should probably be locked for like a cinematography nomination at the very least Mm -hmm. i you know i think nope probably should be showing up in a lot more categories i would probably i think i would probably nominate jordan peele for director if it was up to me if i was in charge um i think he did a great job like he just like i like you know i have my problem i have problems with get out and most of it honestly has to do with the technical stuff i think the writing's impeccable here like the it's almost the opposite any problems i have with it is more in the writing i think the directing is pretty much flawless like he has curated such a talented team of collaborators between you know a cinematographer like hoyt van hoytema nolan and like executing that imax stuff to perfection like i think that's something that probably will not get as much recognition as it should um i don't know if it even qu- technically qualify i don't know if they're even technically doing an awards run for it but broker i would like to see in screenplay Ooh. and if you know if it was also up to me i'd give it an ensemble nomination at the sags but that also won't happen but i think broker should have probably got it would get us should get a screenplay nomination if it was eligible i don't know if it even had a qualifying run though uh i i don't know i don't know yeah um um but uh well i mean you missed you missed uh one of the major ones that probably won't get nominated but but is an absolute travesty if it doesn't get listed and that is in the best song category going to weird al yankovic for (laughs) this is truth for this is i think it's called this is truth Okay. For weird the Al Yankovic story, which I would be giddy if this somehow snuck in under the South Park Blame Canada, you right. know, clause. Yeah, because I I I want to see that man with an Oscar nomination next to his name, and this is the only time he's ever going to have that opportunity. Fair enough, and it fits the film so well um and the film the film is a riot and it would never get nominated for anything of course but it could get nominated and actually even the song says at one point this song is technically available to be available for an oscar uh in the lyrics to the song (laughs) yeah weird al yankee the funny thing is i'm not sure if it is because it because it was like a roku tv streaming thing I don't know. Again, I don't know if they gave it a qualifying run or not. Like in the theater. Uh, I don't I don't know. It has done the festival circuit. It does. It's definitely done the festival circuit. Um, But yeah, I don't know. That's why like I haven't seen it anywhere. Unfortunately, I know you have a great love for that movie. I haven't seen it still. Um, <laughs> to to be fair, to yeah. be fair, I have a great love for that movie because I have a great love for the man. Yeah. Um, yeah. You you may see it and say this is I don't I I I no longer trust Steve's opinion <laughs> on anything. No, I understand um, the the love for it completely. Like I, you know, I don't blame you for giving it. Like you know, when I asked you about what rating you wanted to give it for the letterbox, and you gave it five out of five, I, I was like, <laughs> sure. You know, like I got no because, qualms with that. <laughs> you know, he like, he's. I, I mean, I grew up with him. I grew not. I'm uh, sorry, not personally. I didn't grow up with him personally, but I mean, I grew up with his music, and this and and his and and he was YouTube before there was YouTube. He really was, like so. Um, the fact that here's a guy who's in his mid fifties and he's been doing it this this the most bizarre career, in a lot of ways, made a name for himself as the you know over the thirty five years um or 40 years is astounding it's astounding and and just for being a normal guy who just want to do this and so and even seeing the film seeing this film i went in thinking it was a real biopic i had no idea he was parodying all the musical biopics that we've seen and i'm like you know chef's kiss that was that was that's what i wanted um and so it's I would love, and I, I actually am serious when I say this. I would be thrilled if he got nominated just 
for the fun of it. Yeah. Because the film, the, the best song category is so hit and miss on so many different levels. So yes. often. Yeah. Um, throw him in there. Yeah. Let's, let's have some fun. And to see him perform his own music at the Oscars. That incredible. would be awesome. Yeah, that that's true. That would be awesome. I will. Yeah, like that part, I definitely can argue with having him perform at the Oscars would be great. It would <laughs> make the show a lot more entertaining just from his one song yeah i i would agree with that for sure i i think so i think so i mean obviously i'm not saying it's the best film of the year or even the best song of the year yeah. i would just like to see him get some wreck it i think for him that would be like what is happening like he's the type of guy that he's not trying to win awards he's just trying to do his thing yeah and it would just be i think it would way to way to honor his career and uh so much fun in the show so yeah anyway, that's fine all right. My hot take. Yeah. So speaking of the best films of the year, I figured we'd take the last bit of this to go over, you know, what we consider. Like, I think we could talk about Oscars all day long, um, sure. but, you know, we could save some of that. But I don't know. I guess favorite films of the year is kind of what I'm thinking we can touch on a little bit now. Uh, we, I'm sure we've already mentioned some of them. Uh, but I don't know. I guess I'm curious, like, what is your favorite film of the year right now? My favorite film of the year? Yeah. Is Everything Everywhere All at Once. Everything okay. Everywhere All at Once, hands down. Um, I feel like that film has tapped into a generational mindset. And and I, I remember saying this about um, uh, Social Network. The thing about Social Network when it came out, and the thing that I thought, the reason I thought it should have won Best Picture is it captured a moment in time. I feel like everything everywhere all at once with its emphasis on cultural diversity, storytelling, with its emphasis on mental health, with its emphasis on how we piece together a world where we're overwhelmed by information. I think this is I think this is a moment in time movie. I think it's it's just a brilliant script handled beautifully. It is by far I think the best film of the year in my opinion. In my opinion. Yeah. Um you know, other ones I liked. I like. I, I very much like the Fablemans. I very much like Banshees of Inisherin. and I very much like the Whale. And and Glass Onion might sneak would sneak into my top ten as well, probably. But they're, um, you know, uh, Nope would be in there. Not my favorite of my list of favorite films. Um, Top Gun probably. I didn't. I didn't love it as much as everybody else. But man, is it's it does what it does so well. I can't deny it's good. Um, I'm trying to think of earlier on in the year films I saw earlier on in the year. Um, just one second. There was you know you know what I really liked, but isn't it, it wouldn't get nominated for anything. But I really liked. Uh, I really liked Prey. The, okay. the, uh, the Predator reboot, myself. I really liked um, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. I thought that movie was good. was amazing. I have not seen... The, the films I haven't seen, like Tar. I have not seen Tar yet. Okay. Um, you haven't I seen have, Women Talking? I have not seen Women Talking. I have not seen She Said. Okay. I haven't seen She um, Said either yet. I think, oh, well, it's funny, like, again, like, with Screenfish, I think people assume I see everything. Yeah, I'm I guess. covering something, so like, we pass it off, right? So, no, like, I kind of figured Shane you didn't. Cover, yeah, because I saw she covered women talking, ah. so I figured, I don't know if you would have gotten the chance, I, ah. I guess. But oh, I want to see it. Yeah, for I sure. I want to see it. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it um, twice, actually. <laughs> funny enough, because wow. I saw it at TIFF, and then... Film.ca here in Oakville had a special advanced screening with like Michelle McLeod who's in the movie and some Sheridan alumni who worked on the movie. So I got to see it again. It's also having a limited run starting this Friday at TIFF Bell Light Box before it goes wide in January. Um, So I could probably see it three times before most of the people who are going to see it see it, which would be funny. I don't know if I'm going to do that, but honestly, it's good enough that I would, but yeah um yeah, that's currently my like you know for me like i said i'm quite binary with these things i kind of have you know I, I have a letterbox list of like my favorite films of the year 
Um, you've mentioned a bunch of them. Like I, th- I currently have everything everywhere all at once at number one for me. Like you know, that was the movie that I had to see no matter what when because uh, I heard about how much hype it was getting, and like you know, seeing Asian representation like that on screen, and like I would seen Swiss Army Man, I enjoyed it. I didn't love it, but I was like, okay, I I need to go see this. Um, you know, just like seeing the trailer, I was like, okay, I gotta you know, I gotta see this with Michelle Yeoh and everything. And then, yeah, like, I never gave it a rating because I just thought it was, it was, like, I, I'm still not sure if I, I don't think I want to give it a rating, but I just, it's still my number one film of the year. Like, I had, I was like, I saw it and I was like, okay, I hadn't seen many things at that, at the, that point in the year, but I was like, okay, this is the best movie of the year. And then nothing is really, I think, topped that feeling overall. Like, there's been a lot of other good movies, but, like that experience like i brought i dread i literally had to drag my family because the funny thing is is that it was after my graduation in bc from the program i was doing there and so then we were in vancouver for only like a few days before they were going home i was going to stay for a little bit and help out at the camp that was that i was at and so i brought them to the movie my mom was a little more mixed on it like (laughs) My brother really liked it. He actually saw it twice and I haven't seen it twice yet, but my mom was a little more mixed on it, but I just, yeah, we saw it at the Scotiabank theater in Vancouver and I was just like, yeah, okay. There, this is pretty much everything I wanted out of the movie. And like, yeah, I don't know. Well, it's more I, than flash. It's, that's yeah. I think it's great. It's not a, it's flashy, but it's smart. Yeah. It's very smart. Um, um, I'm sorry. Sometimes I jump in. Go That's ahead. okay. No, feel free to. Um, yeah, like I honestly don't know how to describe what I love. Like I love about the movie because again, I don't know. In some ways, I also don't feel this like too much passion for it. Like it might like I do think I maybe almost like like have a little more passion for something like After Yang only because like it has been so like underseen. I think and underappreciated while everything everywhere all at once really has gotten that and i'm very glad it has but also i can't really deny i think it's my favorite film of the year yeah Yeah. um have you seen um bones of crows or how to blow up a pipeline uh no i've not seen how to blow up a pipeline okay uh did you see bones of crows no i haven't heard of that Oh, these are, they're Canadian films. Right. They are essential viewing. Um, And Bones of Crows is one of the worst experiences, but the best experiences I had at films for a while, because it is just, it, 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 it follows uh, uh, an indigenous family and talks about things like residential schools and everything. It is, it's not graphic, but it is, it is just painful to watch. Right. Um, And how to blow up a pipeline is the exact opposite, <laughs> but, but it was a, it was a hot ticket at TIFF. I was lucky to, to squeak in there and it was the last screening I saw and it became my fifth favorite film of the, of the festival. Um, it's a heist film that is just so well executed. It's simple and it's per- fairly simple. And I guess it's not really simple because they use time shifting, but it's a, uh, it's a heist film with an environmental edge and uh just phenomenal it it was so much fun and uh and really really well executed i thought uh i don't have the technical knowledge that like you do but i mean for me it's it got rave reviews i'm sure it'll get a wide release at some point next year at least in canada okay um but keep an eye out for those yeah i will for sure like i saw yeah i see both of those red tiff um yeah i don't know phenomenal both phenomenal nice um have you seen like i guess this is also in my top 10 i have the northman i don't know what your thoughts are about that i'm assuming you've seen it i haven't seen it okay i haven't seen it it's i do love the director uh that's the guy that did the lighthouse i think if, if yeah could robert eggers uh, yeah robert eggers and uh, I like his work. I just haven't seen it, um, okay. but I've heard it's quite good. And I hear that Nicole Kidman, I think it's Nicole Kidman is getting rave reviews for a performance in that film, but yeah. won't get any recognition. 
Probably not. Uh, and nor will this entire film, which is a shame, honestly. Like, Nicole Kidman would be, yeah, someone who probably could, like, I don't know if she would necessarily be in my supporting actor five, but she would definitely be one of the best performances. I think the cinematography and, like, the production of this movie is just unreal. I think all, almost all the aspects of, like, the technical side of this movie would probably should probably get nominated. I think it's just, it's just a lot better than most things I see. And like, mm. he took this like more block like blockbuster budget and really did something great with it. I think. And you know, I really that's another mm. thing I had mm. to like while I was in BC. I was like not always like near a movie theater, but I dragged my friend to see this before we went back to the island uh, where the camp was and um. Yeah, I was really glad I did because it was yeah the big screen obviously added a lot to the experience. It was it's a very epic movie and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Now the uh, I don't think this I don't think this got theatrical, so I don't think it'll be nominated. But you know what I thought was underrated as an animated film this year uh, was Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers, and I can't believe I'm saying those words. Did you did you happen to catch that on Disney Plus? No, like, oh yeah, Chip and Dale. I have not, yeah, I didn't see that. It's, okay. It's It's got the wit and sass of Roger Rabbit in the late 80s. Right. It's, it's compared to that film in a lot of ways. And it's far smarter than I expected it was going to be. I was like, I, I thought it was going to be a straight up reboot or a horrible, horrible, one of those like fresh takes. And it's like, that doesn't work. No, no, it's uh, it 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 actually works, <laughs> um, and I don't it well it didn't get theatrical, but I mean for an animated ca- for an animated ca- category, I I I don't think it got a theatrical, so I don't think it'll qualify. But it would have been one of those ones that I I wish that it snuck in. It was written by Andy Samberg and Akiva Gold uh, not Akiva Goldsman uh, Akiva Schaefer yeah uh, from Lonely Island. And uh, it's 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 like a midlife crisis movie with a sassy edge. It's 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 a pretty fun. I'm not gonna lie, as an animated animated pick. Yeah, that's good. Um, I like Pop Star uh, a lot. I think that was a pretty funny movie with yeah Andy Samberg and that Pop Star's team hilarious. from Lonely Island behind that. Um, the other movie I would mention is After Sun. I think I mentioned I was going to see this and oh, yes, it's I missed it. But you, you yeah, it was I missed it also a tiff because I like it was one that I like it was pretty in demand at tiff and only had a couple screenings. I tried to get to the rush line for one of them, but there was just like, you know, I asked the person and they were like, oh, there's like four thirty. Like they only there was like 35 people waiting. They only let in five. So I was like, OK, well, I guess I should have definitely got tickets for it, but. Yeah, no, having I saw it in theaters last weekend and honestly it's stuck in my brain the rest of the time. It's got like it uses Queen's under pressure so well. That song is now stuck in my head been stuck in my head for the past week, thanks to this movie. Um it's great. It doesn't reveal what it is on a surface level, like immediately. I think I've figured out what it what what's happening. In the movie, so I'm looking forward to rewatching it with that context. I think it'll just be even better. I don't want to tell you what it is because I want you know you to experience it for yourself. But you definitely should see After Sun. No, it's great. It like if I once I, I see I've it again, it might launch into like my top five of the year. It's just outside of my top ten wow. right now, but it's really that good for me. Wow! Wow! <clears throat> That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. Uh, yeah. I there. The, see again. You can't see everything. You can try. Yeah. <laughs> you can. Um, but I would love to see that. Uh, love to check that out. And I would hesitate too. I realized I didn't say this before. Avatar would be in my favorite films of the year, but not because of the film itself. Right. But the experience is is, is unreal. It's yeah. it's the type of movie that people go to the movies for. Yeah. And I a hundred percent like, is. and I get that. And like, I'm doing that with my friends as well. Like, I knew my friends like. You know, they like blockbusters and like action stuff, especially when my, and my one friend really loves sci-fi. Like, you know, and most of the time I try to challenge their tastes, like, you know, um, but this is one I was like, okay, you know, if I'm, we're also going to do, see it in uh, the 4DX format, 
which is in the theater near yes. my house in 3d with in 3d, 3D. um so i i don't love 3d personally my me vague memory it hasn't been around too much in the past decade but my vague memories as a kid seeing like i don't know kung fu panda 2 with it is that i kind of liked it better when i took off the glasses i will try my best as in like a kid wearing glasses and putting glasses over them it was definitely annoying i'll, I'll try my best we'll see and like i don't think all the shots will work it, like av this is one that's definitely made for it the other ones weren't really no. so the other ones were cash grabs you could make an argument that this is as well but it, it isn't it this yeah. is that's part of the experience uh like there after avatar came out the first one everything came out in 3d mm -hmm. and like of the of the hundred that came out maybe two were benefited from it yeah um literally maybe two i couldn't even name to you what they were but it was that low a percentage yeah and uh, eventually everybody just stopped going because it was annoying it was just an extra three bucks to your movie ticket yeah um but this one must be experienced in 3d for hfr best screen you can get it's it's uh it's gorgeous there were a couple of shots early on where i went oh that looks yeah all right i can you know all right sure i'm telling you when they hit the water everything changes yeah i'm looking more forward so, to the whoa. water stuff because it, because of the 4dx it will have like it's supposed to have like the sprays and all of that so i'm expecting us to like almost be drenched by the end of it if you know if we're going underwater so <laughs> but we'll see yeah i gotta see it in 4dx as well yeah, yeah i agree um another couple films i one that kind of surprised me i didn't think i'd like as much as i did was the menu um because on it like i i don't know for some like it was kind of on my radar at tiff i thought it might be decent it, i knew it was from the guy who'd worked on succession and i've i've watched the first season of succession i don't love it nearly as much as everyone else i have you know everyone who i talked about film with knows this but i have a notorious problem with adam mckay and he did the pilot for that show and i really don't like his movies overall but not that it has anything to do with the rest of succession, but I don't. Anyways, the menu itself. Um, yeah, I know. Like the first third was awesome because for me, like I so, like my uncle has sort of made me a foodie in some ways. So I kind of understood this. But once I found out, it was just making fun of this like whole like reverence they put around this like fine dining experience. It was really fun. Like, I laughed so much for a little bit. And I think the story kind of peters out towards the end. But I still think it's really fun and just a, that it's a good movie. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it. Um, I, I'm looking for I was going to go to the theater to see it, I think. But I just found out it's coming to streaming in January. So I was going to make right. time. I didn't know when I was going to see it, but if it is coming, I, I admit that's one that I feel like I'll watch that in streaming. Uh, but I, I, it's one that I've heard a lot of good things about, and and I'm I'm actually looking forward to it. Yeah, no, I I really I I liked it more. Like I thought it was like it got a lot more laughs out of me and like enjoyment than I thought I was going to have. Honestly, uh, I guess like I thought the trailers also gave away too much, and that was going to rely on shock and surprise. It does a little bit, but there's a lot more to it than i i thought um bones and all was also one that was i definitely thought was really good um i think the performances in that are excellent like taylor russell timothy chalmay and mark rylance he plays such a creepy like he's just a menace in this movie um it's really fun to watch um for a little bit then it comes even scarier but he's really great in it um i think luca gradino who made the movie is a really good director and i think this movie also just certifies him as like one of the better more interesting directors working today um yeah i don't know the story isn't amazing i really i like i like it um i think th i'm mixed on the ending it did something the I didn't agree with its music choice. I thought it kind of took the luster out of the dramatic moment, but I also really liked the final shot. They kind of redeem it in that way, but that's also one of my favorite films of the year. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. I I haven't seen that one yet either. Uh, but again, I've heard good things. I'm looking forward to it. I, I do want to check that out. You okay? Well, oh, yeah. No, I was just wondering if there's any other films that you wanted to... <laughs> you just quick. stopped talking. I thought I yeah, lost I was just thinking, yeah. Um, yeah there, I mean, is there anything else I need to talk about? I don't think so. Okay. Um, unless you want to talk about Violent Night. No, I'm kidding. Um, or Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Um, no, I think we've covered a lot of the, the big hitters. And I think that I actually, and I say this again, I've said this, I think I said this earlier on, I think this was a good year for film. Um, there are a lot of films that I thought were high quality, um, more than I feel like in the past for different reasons. Like, I can't believe we're talking about Top Gun as a Best Picture nominee, and that's not a slight at Top Gun. I just yeah. can't believe we're talking about it as a Best Picture winner or a nominee and maybe winner. I don't think it's possible. I'd say, yeah. But, I, but again, again, technical achievements of films like that. We haven't had a lot of great, unique films, and I know it's a franchise, and I know Avatar's a franchise. And without taking a dig at superhero films, though, Marvel has dominated the box office for the last. 10 years. Yeah. So a film like a film like that to resonate to that point, I think, you know, good for Tom Cruise. I really, I really think good for him. Here's a guy who, who's been toiling away in the industry and has, has created a certain level of film um, that, that, few others have been able to achieve like he's essentially become a stuntman um who's who's be, who also holds the the holds the you know hollywood that holds fans like in his grip but at the same time he also can act yeah you know um it's and at his at his age to be able to do all these things like mm -hmm. he reinvented himself again about 10 years ago with the mission impossible films into into almost a Jackie Chan level of of superstardom with with what he's willing to do, yeah. And and, and I think so. Yeah, yeah like with Top Gun, I think he's doing that. Yeah, like when Top Gun was first coming out, like I didn't think of anything of it. I thought, oh, that's the sequel to my dad's favorite movie back in the eighties, and it's like, yep. I don't know I saw the trailers for it. I was like, oh, this is probably just going to be you know your standard action thing, you know, kind of more of a money grabber than anything. And then yeah. Like it obviously did. It made so much money, especially domestically. But um, yeah, it you know it was a lot more enjoyable than I thought. It, it you know it gives you that theater. It get, just gave everyone that theater experience. I think they've been craving that's like different than you know your Marvel films and your you don't know your all that other stuff. And so that's why it's like been so loved. And yeah, I honestly think that if you look hard enough and watch enough movies, you'll. They'll, it'll be a good year for film from your perspective it should be like there are always good movies being made that i don't think that's ever going to change there should be always movies that should be able to connect with you and obviously there'll be movies that you know some people might look at like the general critics consensus or the best picture list and be like oh this isn't as good as other years i honestly think this year is pretty strong like the only one i have the biggest gripe with is elvis and i and i think that's still much better than like i don't know great gatsby from the same director um yeah. and so like yeah i think this is a pretty strong lineup overall and like you know especially with like something like everything everywhere all once with the fablemans and banshees if those are like the like three picks mainly for best picture i'm very good with any of those like you know i think those are all good picks for sure you know i prefer everything everywhere all at once i think it's the most fun and i honestly think it should win i think it would, it would make the most sense if we look back on it like 10 years from now probably the failed wins in both like banshees will probably be like yeah they're good movies maybe not as much but i think yeah everything everywhere has like captured the zeitgeist so well and it's just a movie that so many people have loved it's took such bizarre elements you know you'd see in the most absurd comedy and made it so accessible for so many people that i think like and like made it a heartfelt drama in the in the process that's like I don't know how you could almost not, but 
again, but that's not to say that Banshees and the Fablemans and all those other films don't have very strong cases. <clears throat> no, no, true. And and you know what? I, I will. My dog is going nuts. Um, it has fallen off. It has fallen off. But I will say, even a film like Black Panther: Wakanda Forever mm -hmm. has mattered to a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. For sure, in ways that other Marvel films have not. Yeah, and it is. It's a good. It's a very good film. It's a very very good film. I think in terms, of, especially. Uh, coming out of the Marvel Mega Machine, um, but it, it it's resonated. It's resonated wow. for a lot of people, I think. And I think that that, in some ways, when you look at the year back in film, I, th I think you're going to see a lot of more films this year talked about for a few years or looked back on with with sort of like, oh, oh wow, um, than than recent years. You know? Yeah. Um, and I mean, say what you will about Nomadland, and I thought Nomadland was profound in a number of ways. Out, um, but it's not like people are saying Nomadland was was one of those ones that man, it really caught on that. I like to use zeitgeist. It, it wasn't a cultural zeitgeist. Yeah. Um, it, it, but people would go, yeah, that should that should win Best Picture. It it was probably the best picture of of them, and um. But they're just it just uh, there have been a lot of films this year, I think, that have left left a little bit more of an imprint than than others. So I think it's been a good year. Yeah, I mean, I think especially with stuff like Avatar and Top Gun, especially Top Gun showing that like there is a true like box office recovery inside that COVID didn't kill the need for movie theaters. Like there was still like a decline, I think, for theaters overall even before the pandemic. And so I think maybe a lot of people thought that, oh, it'll just be like the bare minimum. It'll just be, you know, the blockbusters. And even those may not even get as much, you know, those might go to streaming even faster than we thought, you know, especially with like, you know, Warner Brothers being, you know, yeah, I see that. Um, <clears throat> Warner Brothers taking, you know, putting stuff on HBO Max on the same day and like all those moves. I mean, Warner Brothers is, that's a whole other issue. They're an insane company at this point. Like, you know, they're making so many, like, you know, canceling all these shows and like taking off stuff that's finished, but they're still going to release Barbie. So I guess we're still going to kind of like them. I don't know. It's a very fascinating company, but in that way, but um, yeah, uh, definitely a good year for film. I think, I think there are some, like, I think overall there's more good films I liked. I think I have more films, at least from like last year, that I love more overall. Um, like between things like Minari and uh, I don't know what immediately comes from what 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 happened last year. I I don't know. I can't think of immediately what else comes to mind. Minari is definitely one of them. Um, but yeah, I think overall it's like it's definitely been a good year for film. And oh yeah. Um, with things like West Side Story and the Humans and like even Dune and The Power of the Dog I maybe think those are better films than maybe almost everything I don't know I have to see everything I, I usually like to watch movies twice before I give a firm opinion about them and that's even and that's so hard with you know all the new stuff I'm trying to watch and then you know it just so there's always so much to watch in theory so it's true um, it's true yeah and but yeah i think this hmm, i don't know i don't usually like to make broad statements about a year as a whole but i think yeah box office recovery was good i and i think i think you know it, it just continues to show that if you look for you know some of your smaller films and you like that's been my goal just like to find like you know with more and more like streaming and like you know big blockbusters and like you know as much as like I, I like top gun and i think i'll get some enjoyment out of avatar i haven't see, i didn't see black panther actually um oh you know i thought that was a film i'd probably just go see with friends and then the time i never worked out uh with any of them and so i probably will end up waiting for it to come out in disney plus um but yeah it 
yeah it showed that there's always going to be like good small films and like i think a lot of and i want to continue supporting these auteur directors like i haven't mentioned films like this but stuff like bardo um white noise which were on netflix decision to leave um and triangle of sadness oh, like that's a great one i really like like i like i triangle of sadness was maybe my most memorable theater experience because of just how much it because t- i saw it at tiff and people were just having so much fun watching that um so that was a memorable one it, like bardo and white noise are just they're visions of their directors uh like i know i hondro gonzalez and narito and obama back it's like you know netflix clearly kind of just gave them a blank check to do whatever they want and i'm like i'm kind of glad for it i don't think they're perfect films by any means but they're just so fascinating to me um a decision to leave i don't love the story but i think park chan wook also just shows that like no one's doing it like him like some of these edits and like these camera move and placements it's just like okay no one else is doing that and they're like really cool to watch i didn't love the story I was honestly a little underwhelmed by it. I, I might have to see it a second time and see if that changes my mind. Again, I don't know when I'm going to do that, but um, yeah, it was moments like that that really made me think that, yeah, it, I'm glad that we're in a sort of a box office recovery, but I'm also glad. I'm hoping that these directors continue to get money to make their films. I'm just hoping that they aren't struggling to well, make I mean, their films this- too much. The theatrical experience and the director's experience and that is changing, right? Streaming, but streaming is changing because they mm-hmm. don't have all the money anymore to throw it around like they did two yeah, years ago. And, so yeah, and Netflix, I know, is going to be cutting back. So, like, things like Bardo and White Noise are going to be rare for sure. Or just have smaller budgets. That's you true. Know, that, that's more likely, too. Or maybe yeah. Apple will throw some money. Well, we need to throw... Well, he, they threw a lot of money at Scorsese for... And Scott Ridley Scott for Napoleon and Killers of the Flower Moon, which are supposed to come out next year. That's true. But we'll see. I don't know. Maybe those are successful enough. They'll, I don't know. Well, I don't know how much money Netflix is going to be willing to throw around on these more auteur projects. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Right. Yeah, I think it's probably, I know the meeting's going to end. It's going to be cut off, but uh, it's <laughs> been good talking with you. Um, Steven, I think, appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'm always down to do these more. Um, I know I should be on your podcast eventually. I don't know when that's going to happen, but oh, we will. We'll, we'll, we'll find for the sure. time for sure. Um, but thanks yeah. so much. No, I appreciate it. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah. That was, this was a lot of fun. I, I, I'm always up for chat and film and, uh, and oscars and all that stuff so just let me know for sure all right well thanks everyone for watching and uh this has been dead film critic society your host daniel ling and guest steve norton and uh we'll see you guys next time and the meeting still isn't in so that's great bye <laughs>